Hello. Some time ago I was working on a super beater, SLHF600. So it's a Betamax machine uh, for the NTSC market for USA typically. Uh, and this is of course well out of water in the UK where we're PAL based. We didn't see quite so many super beater machines in the UK. Uh, this one I'd got fully working and I was really pleased with myself and then it mysteriously stopped working. The tape would go in and it would just stop. So since then uh, 12 volt vids who was uh, Sony trained he knows these machines inside out he's done a video which explains a little bit about these decks and has given me the confidence to have another go. So this is the later 711B2 variant of deck which was never sold as far as I'm aware in the UK at all. Uh, now the difference to, from earlier beta machines is there's some different switching uh, to detect when the uh, tape is in the laced and unlaced positions. So I'll briefly go through that and let's see if we can uh, bottom out what's wrong with this machine. So just to orientate ourselves that's where the tape would go in and this is the cassette carriage or basket as they may call it. When it goes in it will push this flap down here which is kind of a block against putting random junk in. Uh, it will then operate this switch to detect that uh, the cassette has been uh, inserted and then the uh, drive from a motor under here can I get you to view that there's a motor here will be directed up through this planetary gear arrangement so there's a, a two-way drive path which is directed by there's a solenoid here which activates both the pinch roller and the direction of power from this gear assembly. So when it locks onto this planetary gear, uh, the energy I think goes down, can't quite remember which way around it goes, and it is then driven into gears underneath here which drive the front loading mechanism. And when this is released, I think it's that way around, then this belt is free to move, the drive will come up, and operate the cassette carriage. So when you put a tape in, switch detected there, the pinch roller solenoid is set so that this belt, tooth belt, drives here. We then go down and then it is detected by the switch here that says the cassette is down. The switch next to it is for the uh, record ident switch here. One of the weird things about this B2 variant is there's no switch in this location to detect that it's in the unlaced uh, position. The way it does it is here with one of the end sensors. So there's two magnetic end sensors on beta machines that detect a foil on the end of the tape this foil you can see here. So it detects that uh, the uh, magnetic flux of that is different than normal tape and so it must be at the end of the tape. So what it's doing here is it's using the metal, there's a metal um, part of a, a rod here which actually is the hinge to this whole assembly. Uh, it swung the magnetic sensor into that so it's seeing metal so that's a way of detecting that it's fully unlaced and if I very slightly lace it by hand you'll see that that swings away so now it's not seeing this anymore and so the deck knows that it's not fully unlaced and that has eliminated the micro switch which normally sits here and the cost and more importantly I think the unreliability of that micro switch. So I have now tested, I've checked with ohms test that this coil is intact, it reads about two ohms as does the uh, supply side coil so they're not defective. I have checked the switch at the back of the deck here, it's normally open and when the actuator which is hiding under here is pushed that way this switch goes closed. I've checked that that's in good order. So 
it should all be in place mechanically. Reasons then that it might not work would be if we have a fault in the regulator at the back. Well, I have just changed the regulator recently. Can I get to the regulator at the back here? Let me show you that. There's a regulator in under here. I changed that because the original one was defective, but maybe my replacement is faulty. Maybe not the highest quality components you can get now. So that's one possible cause. Another, according to 12 volt vids, is that the solenoid can fail here or there's a thermal fuse inside the solenoid. So when I power the deck up in a moment, I want to check that I hear the clonk as the solenoid, which operates this drive and uh, pinch roller engagement. I want to see that go clonk. If it doesn't, then that's where I need to be looking. So I've got this connected up to 110 volts. Let's uh, power it up. Okay. The display is on. That didn't sound right at all. Power up and down. So it's all powering up. The dis when I switch it on, all the right display lights are coming on the front. But that clonk, clonk, clonk doesn't sound right at all. Uh, it was overdriving the unlace, I think. I'll tell you what I really don't want to happen. I'll switch it off again. Uh, there's a... If I, if I drive it forward, there's a coupling here. And I've had it already smashed two of these up. So I really, really don't want that to happen again. Right, let's um, get it into the unlaced position, position again. Or should I leave it slightly laced and power it up and check that it doesn't unlace? Why is it doing that? But it doesn't keep going. It's as though it's maybe not seeing this endpoint reliably. Power it up again. Really should not do that. So if I try to put a tape in now, I'm fairly sure it will not work. Oh, that was mad. It tried to go down, it tried to lace when the tape wasn't down. What's that about? That just doesn't make sense, does it? Just checking the cassette down and record prevention switch. This is uh, record prevention. That's nice and reliable. And now let's check uh, cassette down. Ah, that's not so good, is it? It's sort of working... Yes. Right, so I need to clean the contacts on the cassette down switch. Which means taking this off. That's a bit of a nuisance. This has fallen off. I need to reattach that and put the spring back on it. Okay, I think that's correct. So this is the uh, record prevention switch and this is the cassette in switch. and uh, I will clean them up. So just checking these switches now, uh, there's the record detect switch, that's okay, and the cassette in switch. Good, so that's solid. But our problem was that it was going uh, into lace when the cassette wasn't in place. So it wasn't a case of this being made when it shouldn't have been, rather that it thought it was made when it wasn't but uh, it was still worth getting that right, so uh, let's put that all back together again.
You see, that feels like it's making more than one mistake. It's seeing the cassette down when it's not, and it's not seeing this uh, unlaced position when it is. It all seems a little suspicious. Just get it into the fully unlaced position again. So that's what it's been doing, hasn't it? Been doing that a few times. Before it presumably does see the end point, the end stop, and stops driving. So this all feels a little bit electronic rather than mechanical. And it could be problems with that regulator. So since I ordered two of those regulators, I'm a little bit inclined to just go ahead and replace it with the other one. Now then, STK5441 regulators. Let me run this past you. This is the one I've just removed. I'd fitted this one um, back in the summer. I'd ordered two of these from China. I must admit I've misplaced the other one somewhere, but it looks identical. And they look okay at first glance. STK5441 7816 date code. Now that seems a little old. Were they making this kind of regulator back in 1978? And it just feels too fresh for that. It just doesn't look like something from 1978, new old stock. Something just jars with me very slightly. And the finish on the front is a little blotchy. There's a kind of blotchy patch underneath the part code and a blotchy patch along the bottom here. And it came from China. So I'm beginning to wonder if this may be a counterfeit. But even more extraordinary, actually, was what happened when I took a closer look at the one that came out of the machine. This is as it came when I had it from America. And I think this had been installed by a previous owner in attempting to repair it. And there's no two ways about it. That's counterfeit. You can tell that the uh, material on the front has been scraped away and these numbers printed. So we'll look at those under the microscope. So I have my suspicions about this one. I'm certain that's fake. Uh, I want a good quality STK5441 from somewhere. And if somebody can help me, please do. Right, let's look at these under the microscope and see if you agree with me. Let me show you the STK5441 that was in this machine when it first came from America. So we can see here there's quite a rough surface, but just where the part number is printed, it seems to be scored. And then the part number is printed on the top. And this area here doesn't have anything like the same texture as the main body. Then looking down at the date code, exactly the same effect here. It's been scored just where the date code's printed. And anyway, what does this date code mean? Typically you get two digits for the year and two digits for the week number. But that doesn't make sense. It's clearly not 1951 or 2051. Let's just give them the benefit of the doubt and say they've inverted them. Let's say it's the uh, 51st week of 2011. Were they making STK5441 parts in 2011? I'm pretty sure they weren't. So this part, let's have a look at the back by the way, not much to be gained from that. This part I think we can safely say is counterfeit, but this was the one that was installed in the machine when I got it and we know this didn't work. Looking at the uh, part I'd had ordered from China, it looks actually much better. All of this is a nice uniform uh, texture. Good. Let's look a little closer. Maybe tilt it slightly. And there's something going on here. There's a sort of swishy line going on here. It looks like maybe a solvent has been used to clean an original part number off. And it's left this swishy interface between the part number and the rest of the body. And the only other place where we see that swishiness, those sort of swishy lines, oddly enough, is right above the date code, where again we seem to see some sort of interface here between where the date code is printed and the rest of the body. 
And the other thing is the date code itself. 7816. Well, I may be wrong, but I don't believe these STK5441 type ICs were in manufacture as early as 1978. I'd have expected it to be no earlier than around about 1981, 82 maybe. It seems a bit too early for this kind of part. I might be wrong though, you tell me if you think otherwise, but I don't believe that these were in common use as early as 1978. So, what do you think? Do you think this is a genuine part? Let's look at the back. Not a lot to uh, be gained from that, I don't think. Not as suspicious as the other one, but I think a little suspicious. It may not be a completely um, wrong part, because the machine seemed to try to work, but it may not be... Uh, full spec or there may be some other reason that uh, it's not in full working order. Am I being over cautious? Do you think uh, that is a good part or not? I think we can safely say that that one's a counterfeit which is the one that came in the machine when it came from America. So uh, I'm a little bit stuck with fixing this beautiful super beater at the moment. I think I want to get hold of a, a known good regulator I see uh, and then I can see if there's still a problem with the sensors that detect the uh, deck position on this uh, super beater. Oh well, in the meantime, I'll do plenty more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.